Hi everyone, my name is Curtis Mitch and I'm with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. And this morning we'd like to offer a short reflection on today's Gospel reading. This is the Gospel reading for Monday, June 8th. And today's reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. This is probably a passage that many of you are already familiar with because it, it gives us the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's the grand entryway into what is Jesus' most famous sermon. All right, the Sermon on the Mount appears in the Gospel of Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And here we have today's reading. It's just the first few verses. Now, this is also the Sermon on the Mount is the first of five major sermons in the Gospel of Matthew. The whole Gospel is structured around these five important teachings of Jesus. And in fact, that might be a theologically significant thing because if Matthew is writing his Gospel to Jewish Christians, He's bringing to mind the importance of the figure of Moses. Moses had his law, and those law, that law was divided into five books, and now here comes Jesus, who's even greater than Moses, is a more definitive Moses, and he comes with his teaching in five segments as well. As I said, this is Jesus' most famous sermon because the Sermon on the Mount sketches out for us a charter of the entire Christian life. It sort of marks out the path of discipleship for all those who are baptized into Jesus, all who follow Jesus, and all who confess his name. And so this sermon is of fundamental importance. It gives us, in a sense, the distilled essence of the Christian message. All right, this is the gospel in concentrated form. All right. Now, the first significant thing about today's reading actually appears in the very first verse, and this is something that was noted by the great St. Augustine of Hippo in the 4th century, uh, in the early 5th century. The first passage, uh, the first verse of this passage today reads as follows. It says, seeing the, the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him two important details that kind of jumped out to St. Augustine that we'll discuss here. One is that Jesus went up on the mountain, and two, that his disciples followed him up the mountain. They came to him up on the mountain. And these two details for St. Augustine, they help to distinguish Jesus and his law from Moses and his law in the Old Testament. Okay. In other words, if you remember the story of Moses at Mount Sinai, Moses went up on the mountain, but then he, when he received the teachings of God, he brought them down. He, came, he descended the mountain, and he brought that teaching down to the people who were at the foot of the mountain, Okay, because they weren't allowed to rise up. But here, Jesus is doing something different. When Jesus goes up the mountain, he invites his followers to come with him. He calls them up. If, if Moses was bringing his law down to the people, Jesus is calling his, his people up to receive it where he is. And so for St. Augustine, it shows us that the new law of Jesus Christ promotes a higher righteousness. It's calling us to live at a higher moral altitude, if, if we can put it that way, as distinct from the law of Moses, which was not a bad law by any means. And it did promote a real righteousness, but it was a lower righteousness. And that's signified by the fact that Moses brings the law down to the people at the foot of the mountain, all right? And it also shows us one more thing, that, that when we, we read the Beatitudes, as we look at this, how does Jesus incentivize us? How does he draw us up into his teaching? He draws us up by a love for the reward that he offers, right? The life of the world to come, all of the great blessings that follow from being a disciple. These are the things that draw us upward. This is distinct, according to St. Augustine, from the law of Moses. Moses, where, where it was more a fear of punishment than a love of reward that was kind of motivating and driving the obedience of the people of God. So, so the very setting is significant from a theological point of view. It's distinguishing Jesus and his law from Moses and his law and showing that it's, it's something higher and something greater. 
All right. So that brings us to the Beatitudes, and that's that's really the heart of today's reading. The Beatitudes are declarations of blessedness. They declare a person to be fortunate, to be in a set of circumstances, or to be walking a road that leads to God's blessings in eternity. All right. And the curious thing about the Beatitudes is that it sets forth, it declares blessed rather, it declares blessed a set of dispositions of the, of the heart and a set of actions that are very counterintuitive. It's sort of the opposite of the way the world thinks. You wouldn't think that, that being poor was something blessed. You wouldn't think that mourning was something blessed or hungering and thirsting or being persecuted. It doesn't make sense to say that those are blessed things, right? Are those good things? Are those things that God really wants for us? Well, the point is that they're temporary things. They're not permanent things, okay? And so the Beatitudes, I think, represent Jesus' way of he's challenging us to adopt an eternal perspective, all right? Jesus is challenging us to see the world as God sees it. And as God sees it, the struggles the difficulties, the afflictions, and the the mourning and weeping that that mark our lives here in this valley of tears in this life are barely a blip on the screen of eternity, all right, compared to the blessings. And only God can see those clearly. We can't see them as, as clearly on this side of the grave. But when we finally arrive there, we will understand why these momentary afflictions in life bring us to a blessedness that has no limit and has no end. So all of the Beatitudes are designed to to turn our attention to the life of the world to come, to all of the blessings that God has in store for us. And those are blessings that will not end. So let's just walk through real briefly the eight Beatitudes. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, who are the poor in spirit? Is that the materially poor? Well, it might include that, but it's not really, that's not the primary focus of what Jesus is saying. Those who are poor in spirit are those who are acutely aware of their need. They're aware of their need for grace, and they're aware of their need for God. All right. It's been said that that we pray in proportion to our felt need. When we discover that we don't have the resources within ourselves to walk the road of the gospel, to live in communion with God, and to live a life that glorifies him, then we rely upon God. Those who are poor in spirit are constantly relying upon God, realizing that they don't have the riches of his grace, but he has the wealth of help and assistance to give us. And so we attach ourselves to God. The poor in spirit are rich in faith because they are living close to the Lord God. The second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Well, who are those who mourn? Well, there's lots of mourning in this life, isn't there? There's affliction, there's disappointment, there's bereavement, right? But there's probably something more specific in mind, according to the fathers of the church. Those who mourn are are those who mourn uh, the fact that evil runs rampant in our world. They mourn the fact that that God is disregarded, that his laws are transgressed, and that people live as though he didn't even exist sometimes, all right? They mourn the fact that the world is estranged from God and in a state of rebellion against God, okay? And that evil is that is in the world is also an evil that we see in the church, and we mourn it in the church, and closer to home, it's evil that we see in our own life. Right? So when we mourn, we mourn we, we, we're not just pointing the fingers at others. The first person we should point to is ourself. We should mourn the sins that we've committed. We should mourn those times when we have disregarded God, when we have turned away from him and chosen the selfish path. The third beatitude, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, who are the meek? The meek, the, the, the interesting thing here is that the meek 
are not the weak. The meek are those who actually have a, a, a strength on the inside to be patient and long-suffering in spite of provocation. All right, The weak are those who, in a sense, absorb the evil of the world by not retaliating. Even when they're provoked to anger, they maintain with that inner strength, they maintain composure, all right? And this is what we see Jesus in the midst of his passion. He doesn't lash out and he doesn't retaliate. In fact, he simply accepts it. He he suffers the, the evil of others and he does so in a way that doesn't perpetuate that evil but actually absorbs it. All right, and makes it makes it halt and makes it cease. The the next beatitude: Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are those who truly have spiritual priorities. All right, they have their ducks in a row, you might say. That the things they realize that the things that are truly worth pursuing are the things the things that are truly worth longing for are the things that last forever. It's not the goods of this world, it's not the pleasures of this world or the power of this world. It's it's the righteousness that attaches us to God and and brings us into eternity. It's the thing that brings us everlasting happiness because it's the thing that unites us with the Lord God himself. Next beatitude, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Who are the merciful? The merciful are those who are generous with forgiveness. They're, 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 they're quick to forgive, they're quick to overlook faults, and they're slow to point the finger. They're slow to condemn because they realize that we're all weak. We all need mercy. If we take mercy out of the picture, we're all, we're all sunk, basically, because because we need mercy to survive. We need mercy to be with God. And God has been generous with mercy to us, and therefore we need to be generous with mercy towards others. And that can take very different forms. It can take the form of forgiveness, but also you think of the corporal works of mercy or the spiritual works of mercy, right? We extend the gift that God gives to us, we extend that gift to others. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Who are the pure in heart? It's those who have a true devotion of the heart, a heart that is undivided, meaning that it's not contaminated with selfish interest. It's a heart that wants to do what God wants it to do. It's a heart that beats in sync with the heart of God, you might say. Okay, so it's not self-interested, it's not selfish in any way, nor is it divided or distracted. It simply realizes that God is God and I am a sinner and I need him and to be to live in his presence, to glorify him with my life, I need to to repose the full weight of my soul in his hands, okay? So the pure of heart loves, uh, they love the things that God loves and they love in the way that God loves, meaning that they are always willing to serve. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Who are the peacemakers? The peacemakers are those who seek reconciliation, those who want to repair and strengthen relationships between people, but also between people and God. So in fact, you'll read sometimes in the church fathers that the peacemakers actually refers to missionaries because it's, Jesus is talking about people who, who try to establish that peace between the father and the human family. They're, they're, they, they, uh, they work with God to minister to others the ministry of reconciliation, as St. Paul calls it, so that the father who longs to bring us back into his family and bring us back into his fellowship can actually be achieved, all right? They're creating peace on the earth between people, between men and women, but they're also fostering the peace between the father and the family that he wants reconciled to himself. And then finally, blessed are the persecuted, for, right, for those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I think at this point, we, we finally come to discover that all of the Beatitudes are really embodied 
in the person of Jesus himself. Jesus is the one who preeminently relied upon God in his life. Jesus is the one who mourned the sins of those who were rejecting his message, who were running away from the kingdom instead of embracing it. Jesus is the one who was provoked, and yet he maintained that long-suffering, that composure, that patience, waiting for God to intervene and not retaliating when, when evil was perpetrated against him. Jesus was hungering and thirsting for righteousness, righteousness. He was merciful to all. He was pure in heart. And he is constantly trying to make peace between God and us. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, as we, we, we break out these beatitudes and we try to learn each individual lesson, you know, we always have to remember at the end of the day that these all take place in Jesus Christ. They're all rooted in him. He is exhibit A of all the Beatitudes. And so we see in Christ then not only our duty, but our destiny, that Christ has now ascended to the Father, that he sees God as a son of God, and that is our destiny as well. Well, I hope some of this has been helpful to you today. I pray that God blesses you and your family, and I look forward to seeing you here next time. Thanks.